Italian. Possibly because the papacy had an early toehold on the Italian boot, the devil has been particularly active in the ancient pagan religions from the Brenner Pass to Scylla and Crybdis. And of course, there were no pagan and heathen religions. It was just an insult of the church to call them that. But if Satan was not actually reincarnated in the Bargias and the Medici, he could at least count them among his most devout disciples. The president of the United States said, I don't care if you think that I'm Satan incarnate. And there are those who believe that Niccolo Machiavelli serves Satan as Moses once served Yahweh, as talented personal secretary. However that may be, Machiavelli realized that the devil himself was not a match for a beautiful and evil woman of the sort to be found in Renaissance Italy. Well, wouldn't the devil get credit for all his influence? But drawing upon an evil Latin source, both Giovanni Bravio and the author of The Prince wrote tales of a minor devil who took an earthly wife and finally left her to return to the comforts of hell. As satire, this story appealed to later French and German writers, echoing plaintively down the years until Ben Johnson revived the theme in The Devil is an Ass. And dog, donkey, pig, such like, you know, that's, that's swearing to call people that when it's not literally the case. Um, rather than swear words being an actual particular word. More virtuous, by far, than Machiavelli's scheming female was the married woman of unimpeachable morality who was wooed for years by an incubus who haunted Pavia. If we are to trust the word of the Reverend Father, Sinus Trari of Ameno, who was among the Cognoscenti on Incubi and Succubi. This lecherous demon sought in every conceivable way to share the bed of Duranima, who lived in the parish of St. Michael, having first tempted her with a large cake of a peculiar shape. He was soon whispering sweet nothings in her ear, appearing as a little man of great beauty with golden locks, a flaxen beard that shone like gold, sea green eyes calling to mind a flax flower, and arrayed in a fancy Spanish dress, calling Jesus and Mary, this virtuous woman sought the help of exorcists, priests, and relics in support of her virtue. But for many years, the demon came to her bedroom are connived to waylay her. This lovesick, weeping, and moaning incubus, incensed at her disdain, at her course to new kinds of persecution, forlorning her rings and holy relics, and even snatching her child from her bosom. He capped his concupiscent conniving by stripping the voluptuous young matron on the steps of the church at 10 in the morning when a crowd of people were gathering for mass. Her clothes and ornaments fell off to the ground and disappeared in a gust of wind, leaving her stark naked. Had it not been for two cavaliers of mature age who divested themselves of their cloaks to conceal the woman's nudity, few would have attended mass that morning. Theronima's infuriating purity at last, confounded the evil one. But the similar purity Beatrice led Dante to write, hell's most famous Badecker, proving that virginity can 
be put to a number of unexpected uses. A casual commentator might imagine that Dante Alighieri pictured the deepest hell as one of desolate fog, an ice in commemoration of the tortures of chastity. His icy inferno, however, was not without tradition and precedent. Actually, he was drawing upon ancient Teutonic sources, as all who have perused Sexo Grammaticus, Catmon, and others can testify. His demon Dis, with its three faces, is strikingly similar to the evil deity of the North, known to the Celts and Teutons. The comedy of Dante Alighieri, a Florentine by birth, but not in character, acquired as centuries past a shorter title, Divina Commedia, an expression of the high regard in which the great allegory was held by generations of readers to modern ears, and particularly in translation, divine comedy often seems shrill and needlessly cantankerous. Those who can read it in the original, however, testify to its extreme beauty of phrase. Dante's reasons for political satire and his castigation of the inhabitants of the Arno Valley go back to the struggles between Gilfs and the Ghibellines and subsequent feuding clans. Although Dante was a Gilf, his sympathies were divided in the struggle between the blacks and whites, and his attempts to keep the peace drew their usual reward. Exile did not improve his temper. But that some good may come out of evil is proved by this poet's picture of hell and hell on earth. And the gangsters of the Arno Valley are immortal, if only in ridicule, are thanks to Beatrice and the feuding politicos of Florence. Well, in the next program, we're going to definitely see um, some stuff that is going to show an Islamic influence, it's going to show a Zoroastrian influence. Um, well, they're not really called Zoroastrians, but you know what I mean. And the women that perhaps can take a man to hell, or of course his wife, or girlfriend, I guess, um, his daughter, his mother, his sister, you know, those sides of relationship. But still, it would be his choice whether he's going to be led or misled in that respect. And the same thing the other way around. If you're going to lead somebody to a different sort of uh, religion, um, one of the most common ways, probably about a quarter of the time, was, you know, a spouse or... Um, or a lover was leading somebody in that direction. But like the last story, I think that that one woman um, who had left and gone to be a nun, that sort of self-mortification, you know, doesn't help things either. <laughs>